Okay, good morning, everybody. Am I live? Yeah, okay. And um, good morning to everybody on Zoom, whichever camera I'm on. Um, hi, so my name is Susan Farrar, and I am a student of Lama Jimpas. I've been a student since about 2008. And um, I bow down and express my appreciation to my Lama for all of his kindness and all of his instructions and for being really the perfect example of equanimity. Um, not that I can describe it, but he is. And it's really helpful to observe it, right, to, to experience it. Thank you so much. Okay, so today's topic is equanimity. It's one of the four immeasurables, or also known as the four far-reaching attitudes, um, along with loving kindness, compassion, and sympathetic joy. So why am I interested? Why am I talking about equanimity? You know, whatever it is, it's always kind of escaped to me. I'm really don't know exactly what equanimity is. Um, and unlike loving kindness and compassion and to a lesser extent, uh, sympathetic joy, all of these are very difficult practices, but those three, there is a lot that's been written about them and they are taught quite frequently in most traditions. Uh, there's a number of practices associated with loving kindness and compassion. Um, but equanimity seems to kind of get lost or taken for granted. And I think what has, what happens is because we who practice mindfulness, right? We who are trying to be aware and attentive and very much in the present, we kind of assume, or maybe I assume, maybe you don't, but I do, that I'm being equanimous, just as sort of a byproduct of being mindful. And, you know, I don't think that's true. Um, during COVID, I was part of a book group, an online book group, where we were reading um, current literature um, about white privilege and um, the history of racism in America. Um, any illusions that I may have had about, well, I'm not prejudiced, right? I, you know, um, I'm not biased. All of that pretty much went out the door. I mean, there was, I learned a lot in that, that book club and am still completely blown away by some things. Um, and then recently I was part of a study group where we read a book by Ken McLeod called Wake Up to Your Life. And in that, there is a chapter on the four immeasurables. Um, and his discussion and his practice and his meditation surrounding the four immeasurables are really interesting. They're uh, practices and meditations that I have not run across before. So that was new to me and kind of a different angle on, on all four of them and particularly on equanimity. And about the same time, I was listening, I listened to a podcast um, by Tenzin Choki, and she was interviewing um, a Buddhist and a uh, social researcher by the name of Joey Weber. And he has a book called Why Mindfulness is Not Enough, Unlocking Compassion with Equanimity. So over the last two or three years, it just sort of seemed like this subject of equanimity was just knocking on the door. Let's take a look at this. What is this? So that's what I've been doing. And this is kind of the result of some of the investigation that I've done. Spoiler alert, there is no conclusion to this. <laughs> I'm still looking. I'm still investigating. So first, um, this talk is based on a pretty well accepted premise that uh, we humans discriminate. Even before thought, we have a feeling about something, either a person or an object. It doesn't have to be sentient. We're either drawn towards something, or we are repulsed by it, or we just really don't care. 
And this is really, really before thought. If you look on the, the, the wheel of life back there, that's, it's way before that. Um, then think about it. If you walk into a room full of people that you don't know, are you not, even before thought, drawn towards someone? I'm going to go talk to that person. And others, you go, mm, don't think so. But mostly, you sort of ignore the rest of them, right? So you walk into a store, any kind of a store, pharmacy, Macy's, whatever it is. You're drawn towards some products. You're drawn towards um, colors, styles. You're repulsed by others, and a bunch of it you just ignore. So, I mean, this is that not our experience, right? Okay. Um, there are all sorts of cultural and social and psychological and karmic um, reasonings behind this, why we discriminate, how we discriminate, but that is not the focus of this talk. I'm not going to get into that at all. What I want to focus on is what is equanimity? How can we study it? How can we practice it? Most importantly, how can we manifest it? So here's some of the definitions and the approaches that I've run across. Um, the first example is from um, a place called the Mindfulness Awareness Research Center at UCLA. And uh, the woman who uh, was or still is the director of this research center defined equanimity as how to be okay regardless of circumstances, even minded, non reactive, just the ability to be with things as they are, tolerate things as they are. Yeah, okay, I think most of us would say, yeah, that sounds equanimous to me. So here's the meditation. This is the practice that she recommends. And I think this is very, um, it, very much an example of the mindfulness um, school of, of that tradition. So you start by imagining some situation, and you're on the cushion, right? This is, you know, and then you're imagining some situation where you feel really balanced and you're um, even minded. And you begin to notice how that feels in your body and in your mind. And you just sit with that. And after a little bit of sitting, you recite some phrases to yourself. Um, I can be with things as they are. I handle the situation or I will handle this situation with strength and equanimity. And give some time for all of this stuff to sort of sink in. Then imagine a situation where you feel unbalanced and feel what that's like in your body and your mind and sit with that for a while. And probably what we notice is some tension, some contraction, some aversion, right? You feel your shoulders get up or, you know, you just, you can feel it in your body. And while you're sitting with that, you try to recite some phrases to yourself. Things are what they are. You are as you are. If you're thinking about it being with a person, I can be with this. May I weather this situation with grace and equanimity. And you repeat those phrases to yourself. And while you're doing that, you sort of try to remember what your body felt like when you were balanced. And then again, these phrases, things are what they are, and they may not be what I want them to be, but I can, I can be with them. I have the capacity to be with life as it is. And so this is a process that one does over and over again. And eventually this sort of seeps and becomes part of a body knowledge, a body of mind and a connection between body and mind. So has anybody tried to do a process, a, a practice like this? You probably might recognize it more in terms of metta, more in terms of loving kindness. It's a very common practice to do um, a loving kindness practice where you repeat phrases to yourself. So 
this practice is actually very helpful. But, you know, it seems to me that it's a little bit like behavior modification. You know, it's a little, I mean, it is mindfulness, but like, I feel like something is missing. What Lana said about this is that this is this style can generate an internal subjective balanced state, but it's actually pretty passive and it doesn't really lead to doing anything. Right, it just sort of it, it is internal and it is very subjective and it's balanced in the moment, but it's really actually pretty passive. So the motivation, it seems to me, is to ge generate this internal balanced state of mind. But I really question as to whether or not this practice is transferable to everyday life. Everyday life is surprising, it's unexpected, it's sudden, it's abrupt. And I really wonder whether or not this practice is transferable in the moment. Anyway, so digging a little bit deeper. A while back, I did an online class on the four immeasurables with Sharon Salzberg. Um, and this is what she says about equanimity. She says, equanimity actually does mean balance, and it's the balance that's born of wisdom. Equanimity, in many ways, is actually the secret ingredient in mindfulness, because mindfulness means a capacity or a quality of awareness where our perception of what's happening in the moment is not distorted by bias, old fears, projections into the future, holding on, pushing away, all the things that might arise. So let's, let, me, let me repeat that. Um, she says that mindfulness means a capacity or a quality of awareness or our perception of what's happening in the moment is not distorted by bias, old fears, da 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 da, all the things that we push away or hold on to. So in that context, equanimity means the balance that leads to wisdom. It's only through mindfulness with its secret component of equanimity that we have the right relationship to our experience in order to see more deeply into it, more clearly into it, understand it more fully, more fully and develop insight. So does all that make sense? It's called insight meditation, right? And uh, the one thing that kind of bugs me about it is it uses equanimity a lot to describe and define equanimity. Um, so that's a, that's that's a little bit of an issue with me. But um, my experience with this approach, and I, you know, I've read and listened to a lot of uh, Theravadan lay teachers and uh, monastics, men and women monastics in the Theravadan tradition. And they, they teach um, the four immeasurables quite extensively. And what I understand and find very helpful in using this insight meditation is that indeed, I am able to sort of identify various prejudices and biases and fears and see how they result in my attraction and aversion, how they, my habitual reactions are really linked to being able to identify these biases and prejudices. And hopefully, I mean, the idea is that having this knowledge, having this insight is gonna temper my habitual reactivity to things that come up during the day you know, that this is transferable to day-to-day -day living. And for instance, um, this is not true, I made this up, but let's say that I know that I am triggered by red-haired, blue-eyed men, because I had an ex-boyfriend once who was red-haired and blue-eyed and was abusive. So, you know, that makes sense. So when I meet 
and after doing these meditations and after sort of beginning to identify some of these biases and prejudices and understanding the background behind them, when I meet a red-haired, blue-eyed person, I'm prepared. And I can temper this reactivity that I can feel arising. So this is transferable to some degree to everyday life. But Lana Kaza's approach removing the negative factors so that the positive factors can manifest. Indeed, so from a subjective side, I identify the internal factors that are impeding my balance. And that's a really positive and very helpful thing. And then from an objective side, I can identify situations and people that are also gonna disturb balance and try to find some sort of a resolution. I mean, it's almost like a conflict resolution style paradigm. Um, and that's also very helpful and it's, it's very positive. So experience with that kind of insight meditation? Anybody? Yeah, okay. I'm not seeing any hands up on Zoom. You wanna say a little bit about it? Hmm? When it arises in a situation, I'm better able to like respond to it appropriately than let it. It kind of gives me a a moment to think about how I'm going to react in the situation before I react. Um, before that stuff, you know, you just react and your experiences take over. But doing the meditation helps. When you're in those situations, you have a, a second or two before you react right. to realize what you're going to do and, and realize the reality of the situation, that your biases are playing into your initial perception, and then you can react accordingly. Right. right. Yeah, it's very helpful. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so, so this approach is mindfulness meditation combined with insight meditation. And it's transferable to real life. But the truth, at least for me, often is kind of in hindsight, like, oh crap, yep, there I did it again. And with enough practice, maybe, maybe next time I'll catch it, just like you were describing, maybe next time I'll catch it. But often it really is in hindsight. So, um, but that's not a bad thing. Right, that's that reason. But what it makes me think of again is Lama's expression, at least don't be a nuisance. You know? Um, so, and it's also part of our prayers do not commit any non virtuous action, accumulate virtue and goodness, subdue your own mind. So, all of that is really wonderful, but I still feel that there was something missing. It, this was not equanimous to me. This was a really, really, really helpful practice, but it wasn't, it wasn't producing what I felt in my bones to be equanimity. So Jerry Weber, um, I've got a copy of his book up here. Um, it has a book called Mindfulness is Not Enough, Unlocking Compassion with Equanimity. And he has a two-part definition that I think sort of expands this balance born of wisdom um, approach. He brings in motivation other than that of just maintaining balance and of doing no harm. He introduces relationship. And I think this is a pretty significant step forward. He's got a two-part definition of inner equanimity. Let me make a drink of water first. He calls inner equanimity the open acceptance of our own discrimination, which is what we've been talking about, so that we can respond with compassion and kindness to self and others. He's bringing in others. And next, external equanimity, accepting another individual's discrimination with patience and kindness, so as to respond with kindness to self and others. 
So the key here is understanding our own foibles and recognizing that others also have preferences and prejudices and responding to both of us with compassion. So we turn in a minute to the beginning when I said this talk is based on this premise that humans discriminate even before thought. You and I have positive, negative, or neutral feelings about something or each other. And because of this, we have this tendency to hold on to the things that we like and to push away the things that we don't like. And life consequently goes up and it goes down and it goes up and then we kind of space out because it's no, you know, so it's like that for me and for everybody. And what Weber is saying is that, you know, if we can be very aware of that on both ends and both directions, then things will be a lot more smooth. Things will be a lot more balanced. So he has this seven step approach to developing equanimity, starting with identifying our own prejudices and preferences and using mindful and insight meditation to lessen our identification and our judgment of these preferences and, pre and prejudices. And then to turn that awareness outwards to recognize how it's the same process is happening inside everybody else. And he ends the, his seven step process with showing how mindful equanimity practice can help in creating a beneficial and happier relationships with ourselves and with others. So this to me is getting a little bit closer to what I think I'm looking for. Um, he is bringing in relationship. He's making that sort of the center point. Um, but you know, as I look back, as while I was writing this and I was looking back at these approaches, they all seem to be sort of centered around self-improvement. And as we all know, Lama says, Dharma is not a self-improvement project. So like, if you think of the guided meditation process, right, that I described in the beginning, how to be okay, regardless of circumstances, it makes me a little nervous because a little bit uncomfortable because I could easily shift into living in my idea of what equanimity is, behaving how I think I ought to behave, behaving like a good Buddhist, whatever that might be, and whatever that is, it's not authentic and it's not genuine. Or combining this mindful me mindfulness meditation with insight meditation, again, inter identifying internal biases and prejudices, which bring up, you know, internally, and then um, these external situations that bring up fear and anxiety, and, you know, I know these things, and I can temper my habitual re reactivity once in a while, and then I won't be a nuisance, right? At least not all the time. Again, it's sort of smacks of self-improvement. Nothing wrong with self-improvement, but is that really the focus? So, and it doesn't feel to me to be emotionally really sincere. There's, there's more to this than, than self-improvement. So then going into um, what Joey Weber had, when I broadened this practice to understanding the plight of others and extending kindness to myself and others, I'm getting a little bit, I think, beyond self-improvement and getting into relationship and maybe some self-realization. So, where all of these practices are actually talking about tempering reactions, tempering responses, is all kind of, I mean, it, it seems like it's in the moment, and maybe it is, but it's also kind of after the fact. Something has happened, and then, ta-da, right? 
So that's that's how I'm kind of thinking about it. It's 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 it, it may be right now, but something happens, and then I respond. Then I think about the biases, and I recognize, okay, I don't need to react in this way. But what Lama talks about is leading with going into it from the get go with bodhicitta. So Dharma is not, as I said, a self-improvement project. The self does change over time, but that's not the motivation. Cultivation of bodhicitta, and bodhicitta um, is the altruistic intention to awaken in order to benefit self and others. It's the wish to become Buddha in order to benefit that's the motivation, not self-improvement. The motivation is to become Buddha. The motivation is to awaken. It's a different thing. Um, it's, it's definitely a paradigm shift. Um, I'm not saying that I've done this shift, by the way. <laughs> I just, I'm, just, I'm just, just, just planting this seed in my little head. So what is bodhicitta in practice, particularly in the context of equanimity? So I think in terms of relationships, it has something to do with intimacy, something to do with understanding what makes other people do what they do without disconnecting or distancing from them. Um, it has to be developed and expressed in relationship because honestly, is there anything really that isn't relationship? Is there anything that isn't, right, interdependence? There's nothing really that is outside of relationship. So, which means to me that equanimity can only be experienced, practiced, expressed in relationship. He's been talking, I'm not exactly sure how this fits in, but it does fit somewhere. I, I can sort of like feel it. He's been talking recently, expressing that you have to get right in the middle of things. You got to get in where it's messy, where it's difficult. You got to get in the middle of things. And somehow or another, that links to what equanimity is. And I'm not sure quite what it is, but I can feel that that's right. That, that feels right to me. So, and you'll notice that now I'm switching totally. This is not an intellectual exercise. This is an emotional exercise. This is a feeling exercise. So, again, it's a total paradigm shift from anything intellectual to something quite different. So this final practice that um, I'm investigating comes from Ken McLeod's Wake Up to Your Life. And um, again, he explores all the, the immeasurables, but right now I've been working on equanimity. And the first thing that he does he cautions that expectations about being equanimous actually impede the development of equanimity. That's the expectations that lead to self-improvement. He says that the intention of the practice of the immeasurables is not to look good, but to transform deeply conditioned patterns associated with the sense of I. So note, the development, the motivation is not to develop equanimity. The motivation is to transform conditioned habitual patterns so that equanimity, which is an inherent part of our Buddha nature, it is an inherent part of who we are, but this transformation releases who we are. And equanimity and loving kindness and compassion, they just start to flow as a natural result, a natural manifestation. True, actually. So he says that changes in behavior are not enough. It's the internal landscape that needs to be transformed. 
um, as we start to, and you probably notice this, and anybody, um, who, when you start to notice a habitual pattern, you start to notice, you know, some um, trigger, it starts to lose its power. It way starts to lose its power. And if we go into this with our wish to benefit, our desire for close, intimate relationships, then bodhicitta just starts to flow and our behavior changes as a natural course of event. It's, but we're not going into it with that intent. Anyway, that's, that's kind of, that's, that's where I'm at in terms of understanding it. So here's the brief description of the practice that McLeod recommends. And I, I, I can't do the entire practice. I don't really understand it. This is as far as I've gone with it. So um, I, like all of the other practices, you identify three people. Um, one person that you find pleasant, another person that you find unpleasant, and another person that you know, you're very neutral about. And he suggests 10, 20 minutes of shamatha to sort of, you know, settle your mind, get yourself balanced, at least to some degree. And to start with the person that you dislike and observe how you experience them physically, emotionally, mentally. So this practice gets you really intimate with the person. And it's always, always in the basis, in the context of relationship. You do not stand alone. I'm here, you're there. You are in relationship during this meditation. So this is what he says. Um, start with the person you dislike and observe how you experience him or her physically, emotionally, or mentally. Go through the following reflections with the person. So physical. Are they present in their bodies? How do they look? Are they physically appealing? Do they have distinctive features? How do they stand or sit? Are they relaxed, tense, receptive, distancing? Are their movements clumsy, graceful, aloof? How do they dress? for appearance, for comfort, to conform, to make a statement, like you're really getting in, right? You're not standing outside, you're really getting into this relationship. How, how am I experiencing this person? Emotional, are they emotionally present? How do they talk? Are they aggressive, patient, authoritative? What is the emotional tone of their expression? How do they interact? Do they give and take? Are they rigid? Are they intellectual? Are they passionate? Are they energetic? And then mental, take a look at people mentally, take a look at the relationship mentally. How do they look at the world? What are their political, social, religious views? Where do they put their energy? In the career, relationship? Causes, entertainment, what are their interests? How do they relate to the world? Is it a place to fight? Is it a place to fulfill your needs? Are they looking to fulfill social responsibilities? Maintain their position, prove themselves? Anyway, you can see you're getting like really deep into this relationship and it's time consuming <laughs> you know? and you don't just do it once his technique actually goes much further and as i said i haven't really got the knack of it but just as an outcome from doing this piece of the meditation I found that in a number of relationships that I found have been to some degree or another difficult, um, that I can see the relationship a lot more clearly, a lot more holistically, right? The whole relationship and the person is really fleshed out. Like I'm, I'm really seeing a lot more 
than just what it is that attracts or the two or three things, right? I'm, I'm really making a relationship, if you will. Um, I've found that the relationships have actually become more personal, more familiar, and in some instances, actually more dear. Um, and very definitely, as a result, I am more balanced and more even-minded, and the relationship is more satisfying. So the point of his meditation is to become aware of the differences between the person and my internal representation of the person. It's a lot more akin to self-realization than it is self-improvement. And frankly, I just can't really take the talk any further because this is as far as I've gone. Um, I'm thinking that in terms of the investigation, that maybe the next questions for me to sort of start working with is how can I be of benefit in this relationship? Or maybe the question really is, is how can this relationship be of benefit to others? But again, I want to emphasize that this is not truly any kind of an intellectual process. I mean, it starts out that way, but it truly is an energetic process. It's very experiential, and it's actually pretty emotional. So that is my foray, foray, whatever the word is, my investigation my investigation into what is equanimity. So we got a few minutes if anybody has a comment or a question. Danielle, uh, go ahead. I'm gonna comment on my way over, but I wanna say that was amazing. I love that. Yeah, yeah, I agree. That was really well done. Thank you for sharing the results of your investigation so far. I wish you good luck in uh, going <laughs> further. <laughs> yeah, uh, I was curious, um, what can you say about, you know, like our equanimous or people that practice equanimity or um, are they less passionate? Is there less zeal for life sort of in that sense, like because there's such sort of like calm cool balanced you know is, is there um you know is there a lack of passion then or a lack of sort of like heat and also sort of in the same vein um you know is it possible that it might lead to some type of uh, non um what do you call it like not being responsive uh, to injustice and that type of thing okay um would you say that Lama has lost his passion? Uh, no, absolutely yeah, not. Yeah, no. There we go. Well, okay. <laughs> There's so, definitely some heat there. Yeah, 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 exactly. So no. And what was the second part? Uh, possibly being, it's similar, uh, being unresponsive um, to injustice. No, because uh, you're right there. You're not indifferent. The, the, in in uh, the Theravadan tradition, the near enemy of equanimity is indifference. So it can, it can masquerade as equanimity. And it is definitely not because you are engaged. You are in relationship. How can you not have some sort of response? Now, maybe it's one that you want to temper right maybe you have to you have to you have to throw in wisdom right you never forget all of the wisdom factors but um no you know you definitely you don't you don't avoid and become indifferent yeah Uh, when you were talking about getting, oh, 
sorry. When you were talking about getting in right into the nitty gritty. Yeah. I. You know, I'm not an equine. I don't have equanimity. <laughs> you know, I'm spirited. But um, the one thing I learned when I was a chaplain at UC Davis was to step into the person. Was to what? To step into the person and to ask them how they were and then to listen deeply and to keep listening deeply. And in that experience, I was able to step in and touch people I wouldn't normally touch. Um, people who scared me, like a lot of prisoners, people who were um, close to death, people who were politically the opposite of me. Um, but I found that if I started from love and because they were human, that changed the dynamic in uh, my relationship to people in terms of t tolerance and um, equanimity. I find that in the care of my mother, who is slowly losing everything, I used to just push away from everything she wanted, but now I really deeply understand. Uh, I don't know, at the aggregates, uh, through my meditation, uh, what, what she needs me to do in order to her fully express this part of her life. And I think my, my question would be, is that not the paradigm shift that Lama refers to? Right? You go in the very beginning thing, the top of your head, it's bodhicitta. How can I be a benefit? How can I become Buddha to benefit? That's the motivation, right? So I'm, I'm wondering, is that not kind of what you're talking about? Yeah, exactly. It's, it's, I, I faced a lot of people who were throwing things at me <laughs> in part of my uh, apprenticeship there. And, um, you know, while I did uh, strategize about how to get out of the room if I was going to get hit, um, if I could just uh, stay still and listen and then potentially reflect on what the person was telling me, there were, I wasn't sort of there, mm -hmm. well, although it started out in terror once I stepped in and uh, listened and listened on the same level as just being human, um, dynamic changed. Yeah, thank you. Eli. Yeah. Dirk, yeah, Dirk has his hand up. Oh, Dirk have his hand up? Is it Eli or Dirk? <laughs> Uh, are you calling on me? Yep. Okay. I'll, I'll I can I can see Elizabeth still, <laughs> which is great because what Elizabeth said was fantastic. Oh, yeah. um, and everything that you uh, uh, talked about, I'm as a rank beginner in equanimity, I'm uh, working in a similar direction, I think, or trying to. Uh, but I do have I have one question, one comment, and one question. Uh, the comment is that I actually would go so far as to say that I think self-help is destructive um, because it helps establish the self that has flaws that are unacceptable that need to be changed. 
And so in that way, I think it's poisonous. And uh, does, it's very much like guilt in a way. It, it has an underlying idea that there's a flaw here, that there's, it's like, it's like original sin. Anyway, that's, that's my view of self-help. Um, but the question, uh, I haven't read Ken McLeod's book, and, uh, but the part that you described sounded very similar to Shanti Deva's advice on exchanging self and other in the Bodhicharya Is that, would you say that that's a fair comment? Oh, yeah, I'd say that's definitely a fair comment. And McLeod is a long, long, long time um, Tibetan Buddhist practitioner. And I think he has actually translated Shanti Deva. So, yeah. <laughs> well, I, I failed to say that I love Ken McLeod and I consider him a valid authority on things and a, a good, good source. I even, I, anyway, I, I really love Ken McLeod. So, there it is. Yeah, well. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, he's, yeah, totally. Yeah, I had not made the Shanti Deva connection, but you're right on. Yeah. Other comments, complaints? Okay, all right. Then we will do, thank you so much for staying. <laughs> and, um, yeah, for your comments, and uh, we'll do. I don't have, huh? I got it. Dedication. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. We will do dedication prayers now. Due to the merits of these virtuous actions, may I quickly attain the state of a Guru Buddha and lead all living beings without exception into that enlightened state. May the supreme jewel bodhicitta that has not arisen arise and grow. And may that which has arisen not diminish, but increase more and more. In the land encircled by snow mountains, you are the source of all happiness and good. All powerful Chen Rezi, Tenzin Yatso, please remain until samsara ends. May the teachings of the Buddha flourish, and may the upholders of the teachings remain forever. May all migrators achieve happiness, and may they fulfill all their temporary and ultimate goals. Lo Song, magical display of the deep awareness of all the victorious ones, merciful giver of a stream of profound and vast instructions to the fortunate migrators, please remain always unperishing, unchanging, unfading. Avalokiteshvara, great treasure of objectless compassion, Manjushri, master of flawless wisdom, Vajrapani, destroyer of the entire host of Maras, Songkhapa, crown jewel of the snowy land sages, Lo Song Drakpa, I make request at your holy feet. Thank you so much, Susan. Uh, just a couple of quick announcements um, um, and help me fill in what I'm overlooking. But uh, Thursday night bodhicitta meditation or mindfulness and loving compassion meditation will uh, be also celebrating the Dalai Lama's birthday. So we'll be uh, reading some prayers, and then we'll move into a meditation as per usual. So everyone is welcome to come to that. It will not be via Zoom. It's just in person. But we welcome you. Please come. And then Friday night, expressions at the Dante Event Center. It's a Lama and Clemence's combined birthday celebration. And it begins at 6, and everybody is welcome bring friends, bring family, bring your appetites and, and your uh, dancing shoes. So <laughs> anything else? Um, I'm missing? Yeah, the, um, am, I, am I live? Oh, yeah, OK. So um, Medicine Buddha, which we usually do on Friday nights, we will not be doing Medicine Buddha this Friday night. Instead, everybody will be at the Dante Club having a great time at the party, OK? Um, and on the 22nd of this month, that's Saturday, um, Tenzin Choki is going to be coming for an all-day um, workshop on the four immeasurables. Um, so if you are interested in this subject, you cannot find a better teacher than Tenzin Choki. Um, many of us have experienced her, um, and I've been um, a friend of hers, I count myself as a friend of hers for, I don't know, 10, 12 years now, and Lama's known her for 
I don't know, 20 some odd years. So she's a wonderful teacher, and this will be an all day on um, the four immeasurables. So I really encourage you to take a look. The uh, sign up and a more description is on our website, and that's July 22nd. Is that it? All right. Thank you all. Omo ara ya pasa ya na aindi. Om ara ya pasa na.